So I'm going to mainly focus on how you can use the WSO2 products uh, to achieve web-oriented architecture. OK, so my timer is running. Right. Um, OK, so that's the title of my topic. And so let's move on to the definitions. So uh, web-oriented architecture um, is a type of software architecture, uh, which is designed to be used for website and web applications. So it builds on uh, service-oriented architecture uh, by adding support for uh, web-based software and ap uh, application and services. So the key difference between SOA and WOA, uh, SOA and WOA, uh, is the use of REST APIs um, uh, by WOA, and uh, SOA uses SOAP. So that's the main difference. So um, is WOA just REST? No, absolutely not. So WOA, WOA is much more than REST. Uh, so REST is just the foundational architecture, uh, architectural style for WOA. And it's, uh, uh, it's just a style. And the web-oriented architecture is a set of best practices for designing web applications. So uh, web-oriented architecture uh, includes a set of consumption models. And um, you know, it uh, recommends a set of widely used standards and uh, technologies for data representation, data exchange, and portability. Um, and then REST doesn't address uh, things like identity, security, web applications, model, et cetera. So that's not accounted by REST. So this is the, um, uh, the WOA stack, right? Um, so it has. Um, um, uh, components uh, to um, explain distribution, or it says uh, it explains how you should uh, distribute or how you should make your data available, whether they should be available as feeds, as APIs, as widgets. Uh, then there's the composition aspect, whether you want hypermedia or mashups. And then uh, there's obviously the very important security aspect. Uh, how you can use uh, REST-based security like um, OpenID Connect or even OAuth 2. And then you have to think about data portability and how your data is represented, uh, whether it's as XML or JSON. Um, then think about transfer methods, uh, whether you want to do this on HTTP, BitTorrent, et cetera. So this WAR stack um, kind of explains or makes it clear uh, or explains the relationship between WOA and REST, um, uh, clearly explaining that or clearly indicating that REST is fundamental and uh, supportive uh, to the web-oriented architecture, and it supports the general idea of web-oriented architecture. OK, so the WOA versus SOA battle. So WOA clearly offers a number of advantages to traditional SOA. So it's not um, a competitor, or it's not there to replace SOA. So, um, so WOA improves the service consumption model uh, of SOA. So WOA makes it less expensive, less time consuming to use, because SOA is uh, bulky, and, uh, and then there's the very powerful link architecture to drive information discovery um, and uh, to do analysis. And that's the profound business implications of open web APIs. Uh, so people have come up with new revenue models because of uh, uh, open web APIs. And SOA has uh, accommodated uh, WOA to, you know, uh, or has uh, accommodated WOA to uh, generate new uh, revenue models. So should WOA replace SOA? So the WOA approach is not ideal for every scenario. Even though, um, OK, let's say 
uh, it's, it's not practical, that's what I'm trying to say. So like for the enterprise architecture, uh, with any complexity, no one approach will fit all the needs, right? So most enterprises have the ine inevitable mix of uh, legacy applications, um, existing investments in SOAP-style service-oriented architecture, and point-to-point -point integration infrastructure. So it's not practical in most cases to go ahead and just implement uh, a PO play, a web-oriented architecture. So it will be non-existent if you want to do that, um, uh, you know, considering the current architecture within your organization. So how WOA adds value to SOA? So WOA is a way of implementing SOA by creating services that are RESTful resources. Uh, it, it dramatically simplifies things over the traditional WS star approach. And WOA resources are stateless, so uh, you got a good uh, understanding of REST uh, through Shiro's uh, session, so you know how that works. And then hundreds of companies have now opened their service-oriented architecture to the web, and most are using SOA models for this. So um, a Gartner analyst named Nick Gall, uh, who coined the term web-oriented architecture, also came up with this formula to explain or describe web-oriented architecture. So it's not uh, purely REST, right? It's not just REST, but also SOA and the World Wide Web plus REST. OK, so a little bit about web APIs before we move on. Um, so the significant shift to web APIs came uh, in around, I think, in, in 2007 or so when smartphones uh, with easy to access um, app stores became mainstream. So uh, mobile application development became commonplace and accessible to a huge audience of developers. Um, so uh, except, for, except for a few cases, these application providers could hardly do much uh, without access to data from other companies. Right? And, and it was not only the mobile app developers. It's also rich uh, web app developers who face this problem, because they wanted to easily access data. Um, and apps can rarely do much on their own, so they need to interact with the world of data around them. And web APIs came into the picture. OK, so now we're going to talk about building web apps um, using web-oriented architecture. OK, so if you take uh, the typical three-layered architecture, um, so here you can see uh, the simplest form or the simplest three-layer architecture of any web application is to separate the user interface, separate the business, and the data layer. And then for each of these layers, you can implement an architecture pattern. So um, now in this case, for, for sake of simplicity, I've used MVC. Or else you can use uh, other sub-styles like MVVP or MVP, um, and so on. So it depends on what sort of platform you're using for the user interface. And then what I'm trying to say is, for the business layer, use web-oriented architecture. And then there's the data part. OK, so that same picture, um, we're just going to look deeply into it. So you can see uh, it depends on what architecture you have on the user interface, whether it's a model view controller, um, where the model communicates. Uh, with the REST API. So uh, why I've highlighted the REST part here is because you're uh, implementing the business layer using web-oriented architecture, it's important that you have a REST layer, which communicates with the UI. So you might think there is a data duplication if you have a model view controller approach here, because um, there is data coming from the REST APIs, and then you're maintaining a model there. And then there's data duplication. So you can get rid of the model and then let the view directly talk to the REST APIs um, um, and so on. Right? And then uh, you can also figure out whether uh, you want to maintain data on the UI side using cache or any other pattern. So technologies, uh, you can use an uh, UI or a, uh, you can use 
any framework that supports uh, HTML5, uh, CSS, and so on to build your UI. And then uh, JSON or SOAP, basically everything that comes under the WAR stack for the business uh, layer. And then you can choose your databases. And then you also need to think about the cross-cutting cross security aspect. So the same picture uh, or the same uh, uh, subject uh, in a different view. So you can have your mobile apps or web 2.0 based, Ajax based, rich UI applications uh, talking to RESTful JSON APIs. Um, then those APIs can be talking to separate integration services. So the RESTful APIs and the integration services and the core services uh, can be provided by different uh, partners or from the same organization. So, um, uh, and then the integration services and the core services will uh, communicate with the data layer. So to that picture, this is how WSO2 fits in. You can use the API manager uh, to communicate uh, with the uh, UI, and then uh, you can use uh, an array of products uh, to create your services, uh, either uh, SOAP services or REST services, and, and implement uh, security and so on, governance, et cetera. OK, so let's assume um, you are an enterprise architect. You want to get started. You want to use, uh, you want to implement a web-oriented architecture in your enterprise. So how do you get started? So, so keeping, keep in mind that you already have some existing services. You can't start from scratch. Uh, you have your existing databases. You have your legacy applications, uh, ERPs, uh, CRMs, and your payroll, sales systems, et cetera. And then you have the consumer channels that want to access this data. So currently, maybe it's all point-to-point -point, uh, integrations, and it's pretty much a spaghetti mess, as indicated here. OK, so the next step um, is to enable service-oriented architecture. Right, so you have the existing services. So let keep them aside so you're not going to do anything to those. Then you have the legacy applications. We'll worry about that later. And then you have uh, the databases and the services. So what I'm trying to do now um, is create a service layer, right? Um, so if you want new services, that's pretty straightforward. You use a product like the application server or even the microservices server uh, to create your services. So the application server allows you to create uh, RESTful services, uh, JAX RS services, or SOAP services. And then you can host your application lo logic as services in the application server. Then uh, you have the data. And you want to expose your data as services, basically a data services layer. So uh, a reason why you would want to do that is if you don't want people to access your data directly, but through a service interface, then it's useful uh, to have a services layer to expose your data. And also, let's say uh, down the line, you want to change the database, uh, or you want to change the databases. And uh, you decide to move from, say, uh, MySQL to uh, a NoSQL um, database like Cassandra, then your uh, interface remains the same, but your data has changed, or the data technology. So, OK, so let's say all that's done. So now you have a clean services layer to expose your data and core business. So you also need to think about governing these services. You can't just create services and think, um, OK, I'm done with it. But you need to be able to govern the services in order to um, uh, control uh, or, or basically eliminate things like service duplication, proliferation, and to let people uh, know what services are available so that they can uh, use them efficiently. So there, you can use the governance registry. Next, you need to think about the security uh, aspect. Uh, who accesses these services? So um, you can use the identity server to manage your users, manage identities, 
um, and then uh, uh, do things like federation using technologies like SAML, OpenID, and um, uh, do user provisioning, um, and also um, federation and uh, also uh, uh, delegation using OAuth 2, and then also do uh, RESTful security uh, using uh, OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, etc. So once the security is in place, so the identity server can also be used to uh, uh, enable single sign-on for your web application. So that doesn't come into play yet because we are only trying to secure your, trying to secure the services. Okay, so now that we have the services infrastructure, we have to think about um, connectivity. So let's first focus on internal connectivity. So uh, the ESP is our lightweight enterprise service bus, which can be used to do service mediations, integrations, and uh, basically connect anything to anything. Right? So how it does that is uh, through its capability to support various transports, uh, various protocols, uh, and because it has support for adapters. Like we already have uh, a bunch of adapters um, for legacy applications like SAP, HL7. Um, and then if you do have other legacy applications, then you can um, extend the ESV to create these adapters and connect to these legacy applications. Um, and then the ESV can act as a central uh, a gateway, a message gateway or a security gateway. So if any of these messaging requirements or security requirements come in, they first hit the ESV and then the ESV will dispatch a request to the relevant components. So this is about internal connectivity. So what if you want to connect to um, applications or web APIs outside uh, your enterprise? Um, so like, for example, if you want to connect to um, Twitter or Salesforce, Twilio, et cetera. So for that, we have our connectors. So uh, the ESB uh, is not shipped with all these connectors because that will make the ESP very heavy. So uh, we have a separate connector store, uh, which has around 150 connectors uh, supporting various uh, uh, cloud applications. So you can download these connectors and uh, install those connectors in your ESP instance and, um, and, connect, to, and connect to those uh, cloud applications. So more connectors keep coming up, uh, and then uh, they will be made available as they are developed in the connector store. So that's how you uh, do uh, external connectivity. So next up is how you can have complete web-oriented architecture in your architecture, um, in your enterprise. So here you can see we've used the API manager to create an API layer or you might even say the API facade layer. So basically exposing your entire business as APIs. So your consumer channels or the UI layer of your web applications will communicate with the API manager directly. And the API manager allows you to manage the usage of your APIs um, and then uh, uh, derive uh, statistics and then also come up, you can come up with revenue models on the usage of your APIs. So you're exposing your business to the outside world, and you can come up with revenue models using the API manager. So we have now um, done a basic structure of uh, the web-oriented architecture in your enterprise. OK, so if you want other components, if you want to monitor your system, then you can use uh, products like the data analytics server, the machine learner, and the complex event processor. So the data analytics server is uh, used mainly for uh, batch processing of data um, using uh, Apache Spark. And then we have the complex event processor if you want to do real-time monitoring. Um, and uh, it's based on uh, Siddhi. And then we also have the WSO2 machine learner, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, takes in data and then uh, it applies machine learning algorithms to uh, create data models 
and these data models can be used to uh, make predictions. So that's the uh, monitoring and analytics part. And then you can make use of uh, the rest of the WS2 products to uh, cater to your other requirements. Right? So for example, uh, the, the message broker can be used for persistent messaging and for uh, reliable messaging. It supports uh, JMS, AMQP, MQTT. And then you can use the, sorry, the business process server uh, for uh, long-running services. So for example, uh, you are going to have workflows long-running workflows that will go on for like days uh, in, your, um, um, uh, in your enterprise. For example, if there is an order that comes in, then uh, it might take some time to process that order. Um, so if you want to maintain the state of that workflow and if it's long-running, then and if, if it requires human intervention, then you can use the business processor, business processor product. And then there is the process center which, uh, which takes care of or which manages all your uh, workflows and processes. And then um, you can use the gateway product, uh, which does basic HTTP routing. Um, so you can use it with the microservices server, uh, which can be used to host your microservices. And then uh, the user engagement server, even though it does not fit into the WoA architecture, uh, that is also uh, a product that you can use to create web applications if you want to create uh, UIs, uh, gadgets, and so on. You can use the user engagement server. So the user engagement server is going to be renamed to um, the dashboard server. So that's coming up. But it's user engagement server for now. Um, OK, so once you've created your applications, you may want to manage your applications. So we have another product for that, which is the WSO2 Application Manager. So it has a bunch of components. So um, it has an application publisher and application store. So if you want to catalog your applications and manage these applications and see who's accessing them, uh, you can use the app publisher and app store for that. Um, and then uh, during the runtime, the API calls will hit a proxy, which is the web app gateway, and then it will dispatch uh, the requests to the uh, applications. And if you're using, if you have subscribed to several applications, uh, the application manager can enable single sign-on, so you can um, just log in once and uh, access those applications uh, seamlessly. So um, key takeaways of this presentation are that web-oriented architecture is not just REST. Uh, REST is was fundamental architectural pattern, and uh, web-oriented architecture offers a number of advantages to traditional SOA, and most SOA, uh, most businesses have exposed their service-oriented architecture using WOA models. And finally, web-oriented architecture is REST plus SOA plus www. <laughs>